Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem and today we'll talk about Cadenza Doppia and five cool things you can do with it. The progression called Cadenza Doppia in Italian, literally a double cadence, is one of those very basic patterns that were flexible enough to be used in completely different styles of music, from early Renaissance motets to high baroque violin sonatas. In this episode, we will check it out in detail and show five things you can do with it, and by this, practice your counterpoint. Before we start, let's see how it is connected to other cadences that we already know and check its basic variants. Cadenza doppia is one of the Italian names for what we call in our terminology a four-step authentic cadence. Check our episode about cadences if you need to refresh your memory. To achieve the basic variants of a cadenza doppia, one may vary the tenorizans clause and leave the cantizans and basizans as they are. This is how it sounds without any movement in the tenorizans. In the most common variant, the tenorizans moves together with the cantizans, ascending to the sixth, and then descending back to the fifth. We will just call this one the most common variant, as we don't want to over-label things unless it's absolutely necessary. A slightly less common variant, but equally legitimate, is for the tenorizans to descend to the fourth instead. These three variants are to be found abundantly in music from the early 16th century all the way up to the 18th century. These are naturally only models. In actual compositions, the voices may exchange their functions during the progression and appear in varying positions, as in this example. Further options include a division of the tenorizans into two parts, the first of which will be on the sixth, and the second on the fifth. In minor modes, it creates a bad interval with the cantizans, that is, one which is augmented or diminished, and therefore was used only from the beginning of the 17th century. A last variant, that for a change also modifies the cantizans, is made with a prepared fifth that is then used as a dissonance against the sixth of the tenorizans. On a contrapuntal level, one may look at the models and wonder. Why is it okay for the cantizans to introduce an unprepared dissonance, the fourth, and then use it as if it were prepared? As if the dissonance prepares itself? This is a very good question. The answer, however, is rather disappointing. Despite going against basic concepts of counterpoint, according to which dissonances must be prepared with a consonance, it somehow became okay to do so within this specific context. In Vicentino's treatise from 1555, probably the earliest treatise which speaks of it, it is described along with the term syncopa tutta cattiva, a syncopation which is all bad or wrong. Thus, Vicentino confirms for us that this progression is officially wrong, yet it exists and it is correct to use it. As in many other cases, rules describe the practice in a way which is too general to deal with all the exceptions and the irregularities generated by living musical traditions. Back to the cadenza doppia. A very important and common addition to it is the prepared seventh. The voice that will make the tenorizans starts earlier at the seventh, prepared of course, and then continues according to the most common variant, with the sixth and then the fifth. Typically, on the second step, only notes that are either the octave, sixth, or fourth can take place. However, some particularly naughty composers, such as Claudio Monteverdi for example, chose to ignore that convention. 
In this excerpt from his five-part setting of Lamento d'Ariana, we have a cadenza doppia with a prepared seventh in the lower four voices, while the highest voice holds the tenorizans throughout. This creates a clash on the second step of the cadence, that includes the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth at the same time. I'll play it slowly and strike every step so that you could hear it clearly. Now that we know the basics of cadenza doppia, let's see five cool things we can do with it. The first four use the progression of the voices in order to create sequences. Let's see. 1. Going in circles. If every time that we land on the finalis of the cadence we start a new cadence, we create a sequence of descending fifths. Here is one way to do it. Adding a prepared 7th brings a nice effect too. In order to prepare the 7th every time, the cantizans on its 4th step needs to descend the whole tone instead of the normal semitone. Another option is to use the variant where the tenorizans is divided. As we said, due to its bad interval on the first step, it was used only from the beginning of the 17th century, where such intervals were more accepted. This might be a good point to remind you that these examples are mere theoretical practices. Such long repetitive sequences were generally not favored in actual music, and especially so in the 16th century, where variety was regarded as extremely important. Even in the 17th century, when some composers sometimes used shameless repetitions, it was of longer units and not such short fragments. Let's get on with the second cool thing one can do with a cadenza doppia. Descending stepwise. If taking the prepared seventh model, we just need to change the last step in the cantizans and in the tenorizans to make it work. For example, like this. The problem is that when repeating the sequence literally, we quickly arrive at weird keys and creating a need for many accidentals. If we want to avoid weird keys, we could use the sequence less literally and more diatonically. Or in other words, put the accidentals only where we see fit, like in this example. This rather free attitude towards accidentals may create intervals and progressions that would not have been tolerated by strict composers. Nevertheless, in the first half of the 17th century, this seems to have been the attitude of many composers. The third cool thing one may do with a cadenza doppia is to ascend stepwise. For this to work, the last step of the tenorizans must ascend a step to the sixth that will become a fifth when the bass ascends thus bringing us to the initial position of the progression. Also here, if we follow the progression literally, we quickly end up with many accidentals. So here is a more diatonic version. Notice that since the progression is ascending, for this sequence, I chose the less common variant of the cadenza doppia, where the tenorizans first descends to the fourth before coming back to the fifth. This is in order to create a more pleasing and less repetitive line for the tenor part. And here is the fourth cool thing one may do with a cadenza doppia, 
descend by thirds using the variant with the dissonance between the sixth and the fifth. And see what happens when we add a bit of movement in the bass. It almost starts to sound like music. Indeed, moving the bass during cadences can open up the possibilities immensely. This is the fifth cool thing one may do with a cadenza doppia. Let's see. So, if we take the most common variant of the cadenza doppia and try to move the bass during the progression, we may start with consonant variants, that is, those that fit with the notes that are already there. This would mean to move the bass on the second step to the first degree or the third degree of the mode, like this. Since it's all consonant, it doesn't sound like anything special. Other variants, however, are dissonant, and that fact didn't stop composers from using them. A very common such dissonant variant is made by moving the bass to the fourth degree, disregarding completely the dissonances that it creates. On the second step, we have harsh dissonances, a seventh in the tenor and a ninth in the alto, both not treated as dissonances should be treated. This specific variant is found in music starting from around 1600, but described in a treatise only in 1677 by Bartolomeo Bismantova. It is found under a set of examples labeled Preparamento alla Cadenza, Preparation of the Cadence. This liberty to move the bass freely during the cadence opens up many possibilities, and this is true also for the inner voices. For example, in this variant of the bass, the alto voice has two options. One, as in here, stay on the D, pretending that the bass doesn't move although it does, or two, try to respect the bass and be consonant with it by ascending to the E flat. Applying the same idea to other cadenza doppia variants, this time in a major mode, will lead to different results. For example, in these two cadences, I used the variant where the tenoritans is stationary and moved the bass once to the fourth degree and once to the augmented fourth degree. And if we move the bass to the fourth degree while playing a cadenza doppia with a prepared seventh, it gets even better as parallel sevenths are created. The earliest example of such a cadence is from around 1600, in Emilio de Cavalieri's Lamentations for the Holy Week. In the verse, Si est dolor similis sicut dolor meus, if there is any sorrow like mine, he appropriately uses the harshest tools he had to express sorrow in music. In a manner that is a bit similar to the example we saw before from Monteverdi, Cavalieri combines the variant with the prepared seventh with the variant with the stationary tenoritans. If this is the only thing that he would have done, it would have looked like and sounded like this. But this wasn't enough for Cavalieri. On top of that, he also moves the bass, and by this creates the parallel sevenths we showed before and leads to a highly dissonant moment on the word dolor, sorrow. It includes, if the difference in octaves is disregarded, an A, B, C, and D, all at the same time. He then repeats the same progression with a slight rhythmic difference. I will play the whole sorrowful phrase.
This was but a taste of what one can achieve by moving the bass and playing around with a cadenza doppia. We hope you enjoyed it. Perhaps you could try some of it yourself. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music, feel free to support us on Patreon, comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.